because we're going to revisit the idea of type. And we're going to talk about why type is so important. We have a tendency to think, oh, the chart has got all this cool stuff and people want to go deep into what does this gate mean and what does this line mean and why, you know, what is, what, what is this uh, variable or whatever. You know, we have a lot of big questions about all the little parts of the chart. And it's cool and it's fascinating and it's compelling. I know I've been studying it for 20 years and I still find things that are exciting about it that I love. And... There's also sublime simplicity and a vital simplicity in understanding the nature of type and what does type really mean. And when we talk about type, I wanted to come back and have this conversation because we haven't had this conversation in a while. Um, and revisit type. One of the things that I have done is I have rewritten a lot of the vocabulary in the human design system to make it more empowering and inspiring and aspiring. So. Uh, as we go through some of this today, we're going to revisit some of the language and even some of the, the the purpose of the emotional themes. Because I think even when we look at the emotional theme, like, for example, when I tell projectors, oh, you're supposed to be bitter. And they are there. You know, if you're a projector and somebody tells you, oh, you're bitter, that's not a particularly inspiring thing to say to someone. So we're going to explore from a different angle, the meaning of those emotional themes and how to work with those emotional themes so that you can use them as the messengers that they really are. So without further ado, so today we're going to talk about quantum alignment by human design. And most importantly, we're going to explore the quantum purpose of the types. And I'm going to give you just some new ways to think about type and why type is so important. I think sometimes we forget why we're here. And I think even in the context of type, we, we forget that the nature of our human design type is part of our energy configuration and it will influence our life story, our soul's curriculum, and how we interface with the quantum field. We are all powerful creators. You, you are powerful creators, in case you forgot. You are powerful creators and the way in which you create is going to be dependent on your unique energy configuration, your human design blueprint. And when you understand the nature of how to work with that blueprint effectively, it gives you the power to amplify the full expression of who you are in the world. It also gives you the power to do this. You're here for a reason. And sometimes I think we forget what that reason is. The reason for you to live here in this lifetime to explore is to get yourself to the highest possible state of what I like to call quantum alignment. Quantum alignment is the state of your life purpose and your soul purpose existing or coexisting together in harmony with each other. Okay, so it's interesting to note that for the most part, when we have struggle in our lives, that that struggle is oftentimes self-generated and built into the blueprint of the chart. We're not designed to suffer, but we are designed to wrestle with ourselves a little bit, to struggle and to duke it out with our soul purpose and our life purpose and to find that place of harmony between those two pieces of ourselves because it's from that journey, that exploration of how do you create the harmony between your soul's intention and your life purpose so that you can, the, the purpose of that struggle is to help you grow, is to help you create a deeper expression of your soul through your life story. and. That's really the whole purpose of why we're here. You know, we, I think sometimes when we talk about purpose, we want it to get super complicated and we want deep purposes like my life purpose is to rescue people from burning buildings. Your life purpose is to be yourself. And there's no job associated with it. There's nothing associated with it. It's all of an internal process of exploring who you are in this incarnation and how to bring out the highest expression of this story that you're occupying. And that's the purpose. Don't make it complicated. All right, so this, in the name of keeping it simple, which is not simple, this is not simple, but this is, I'm going to try to do this in the simplest way possible. We have two key components that we need to look at when we look at how to bring alignment between your soul purpose and your life purpose. You have a life story that you're occupying. When you were conceived and you're, you began to grow into the baby you were becoming, the human you were becoming. When you were conceived, your father's energy actually calls out of the earth what's called a design crystal. It's not a physical crystal. So, you know, this is my, my crystal sitting on my desk. It's not a physical crystal. 
it's an energetic matrix. It's a crystalline information grid. That crystalline information grid contains the code for your life story. We talked about this a little bit last week, too, when we looked at genetics. It contains your genetic code, your epigenetic code. It contains all those core elements that are crucial to your life story, like who are your brothers and sisters and your grandmothers and your mom and where you're going to live and what, what are some of the things that you're going to do as part of your life story. So that code, your design crystal code, is carrying all that information and, and interweaving into the expression of your physical body and your physical material world so that your world becomes this place where this crystal and code can express itself. Once you are mature and you're born, that design crystal code takes up residency in the Ajna Center. You're, at the time of your conception, your soul has also got a code. Your soul has its own intention, or I like to call it your soul has its own curriculum. Your soul or aspects of your soul are manifesting into this life story that you're occupying because they, because your soul is seeking to grow and learn over the course of your life. It has a purpose here as well. The soul purpose is contained within the personality crystal, which is, again, another crystalline matrix of information. That care, and that soul code, that soul purpose, is encoded into this personality crystal, which then ultimately takes up residency in the head center. So it's interesting to note that both of these parts take place or take up residency in the mind. And so oftentimes our perception of who we are is influenced by these crystals or sometimes our perception of who we are takes us away from these crystalline codes and then we really start to have disruption in who we are and we become significantly misaligned. As I said, the intention here is to learn how to live both of these parts of the story of who you are together, your life purpose as a human being and your soul's curriculum. And if you like, I like to think of it kind of like your, your life purpose is a high-speed electric train, right? And your soul purpose comes and rides as a passenger inside this train. And the more you can kind of relax into the ride and let that fast train go with as little amount of friction as possible along the track that it's designed to go on, the more you can relax into that ride, the more alignment you create between the curriculum of your soul and the purpose of your life. Your human design chart is like an instruction manual from your divine self explaining to you how you're explaining to your human self, all right, how to remember how to be divine. There's a code in living true to your chart, and that's a synthesis of both the soul code and the life code. There's a code in this chart that's basically an instruction manual that tells you how to tap into the highest potential of your divine expression through your human story. So let's talk about how do we create alignment. The first thing you have to do to create alignment is you have to fully activate your creative capacity. What that really means is you've got to learn how to stop being reactive. So let's talk about that a little bit. There's two kinds of creativity. There's situational creativity, which is in the moment, it's reactive, it's determined by your conditioning, meaning your life, your past life experiences, not your past life experience, but your past life experiences, <laughs> your genetics, your memories, your emotional experiences, all of these that are going to influence how you create. Situational creativity offers you short-term solutions. It's finite. It comes from the conditioned mind, so it really doesn't go beyond what you think is possible. It res it's a result of thinking and reasoning the mind. It is consequently reasonable, and it is most closely associated with the splenic energy. And if you think about the purpose of the spleen center, which is the triangle on the left-hand side of the chart, the purpose of the spleen is to give us a pulse, usually fear, a pulse of fear that gives us a driver to take some kind of action that is about protecting ourselves in some way. So situational creativity is often instinctual, um, protective, or survival-based. And as such, it's a cortisol-based response. It's a stress response or a stressed-out response, depending on how you want to look at that. Fundamental creativity, which is sort of the name of the game. This is where we want to head in our life transcends our conditioning. It oftentimes arrives to us through epiphanies or ahas. That's sort of how fundamental creativity often works for us. It's this epiphany, this thing that pops into our consciousness all of a sudden. It comes from infinite sources. It's from the quantum field. 
It's imaginative and possibility oriented. It aligns with cosmic order. And this is where you may need to take a leap of faith for some of you, depending on what your, your, your spiritual beliefs are. But I believe, and I think there's a, big, a lot of science that really kind of confirms this, that there is a cosmic unfolding of life. Life has a certain amount of intention and a certain destiny, so to speak. And we have the option through living true to who we are, following our human design strategy, to live in alignment with cosmic order or to live out of alignment with cosmic order. It's a lot more fun when you're living with cosmic order. If you've ever seen birds fly in murmuration, right, when you've got this big, you know, glob of birds flying around and they're, they're like not running into each other, which is amazing to me, you know, that's cosmic order. If one of the birds decides, oh, heck, I'm not going to do this and starts flying their own direction, you know, not only are they probably going to crash and burn, they might take down the whole flock with them too, right? So we want to align with cosmic order. It's way easier. Fundamental creativity is technically unreasonable. It's not about figuring it out. It's about recognizing that through holding emotional frequencies of energies and having faith, we can create beyond what our minds think is possible. We can break the patterns of possibility. So this is the place where we can ultimately actually tap into or manifest miracles. To explore our creative ability a little bit more, I'm going to whip through this because I know I've talked about this quite a bit over the last few years, but if you're new to this information or if you need a little review, I want to just quickly review this for you. To understand the nature of how we create, you really need to look at the basic components that we are drawing upon when we create. So when we're creating, I'll call this basic quantum mechanics, it's not really quantum mechanics. We are first and foremost choosing options, possibilities out of the quantum field. There is a field of energy, non-manifested potential that exists in constant movement that contains within it all of the possibilities of the things we could be experiencing in our lives. Multiple, multiple outcomes to all the different situations we're experiencing right now. All of that lives in this energy field called the quantum field. The, sec the second thing we work with or we create from is what's called the mental and the emotional bodies. This is the place where you store your memories, your conditioning. This is the place where you have your human design lives. It lives in the mental and the emotional body. This is the blueprint for what your life story is about and all the memories and experiences that you've had in addition to your epigenetic conditioning, your epigenetic memories, and your gene code. All of this energy is contained here in the mental and the emotional bodies. And it's going to influence what you pick out of the quantum field, right? The subtle body is the next creative component that we work with. This is simply the energy template that holds in place what you've manifested in your physical reality right now. So right now you have an energy template that's holding everything you've got going on right now in place. And it's also sort of if, if you've got something that you've just discreated out of your life, the energetic echo of that might still be in this subtle body template as it disappears and moves out of your field. And then the last piece that we look at when we're talking about the creative process, we're looking at the manifested reality, the physical, tangible manifestation, or what quantum physicists will say, the collapsed potential out of the quantum field that is your life right now. If you want to look at this in a more simple way, there's a quantum field of infinite possibilities. It's not manifested yet. Your life right now is manifested. You choose those possibilities and manifest them into your physical reality. And you choose through a filter. That filter is the narrative you tell about who you think you are. All right. So this narrative is who you think you are. The story you're telling about your life is the filter. And that filter is going to influence what you pick out of the quantum field. Consciousness is the rocket fuel of this creative process. And if you want to look at this model in a different way, here's just another way of looking at it. Consciousness is the mediator between the physical manifested reality the vital body or the subtle body, the mental and the emotional bodies, and the quantum field. The quality of consciousness that you hold influences the quality of what you create. When quantum scientists look at quantum particles, the building blocks of matter, what they know is that matter can either be measured in movement, or these building blocks, these atomic particles, particles can be measured in movement, or they can be measured in their location, but never both at the same time. Okay, movement contains potential. Okay, and that quantum field, as I said, it's a constant moving, non-manifested waves of potential, right? 
location, when we locate a quantum particle, it becomes manifest. So the minute you see a quantum particle moving and you're like, I want to see where that is, and you look at it and you locate it, it actually manifests into physical form. It becomes a tangible thing. I don't know if an atom is tangible, but quantum scientists can at least see it. It becomes located or manifested. The meanings we hold about ideas, thoughts, and archetypes determine what we create and manifest. The meanings you have about things are determined by your conditioning field. And if you want to create something different in your life, you have to change the meanings that you have. What does that mean? That means your perception of the world determines what you create, and it determines which potentials you activate in the quantum field. So if I say the word creativity to you, this is a word I've been using a lot with my students all week long. If I say the word creativity to you, and I'll give you a second just to think about what is creativity. You're all going to have a different thought about what is creativity. Maybe some of you are going to think about, oh, well, God, I'm not creative. My brother's the creative one. He's an architect, but I'm not. I'm just a scientist. Or maybe you're thinking about, dang, I don't do enough creativity in my life. It's really fun, but I work so hard. I just don't have the time to be creative. Or maybe you're thinking, wow, I really had dreams about a creative fulfillment of some sort, but I, you know, I'm not giving attention to that very much anymore. Or maybe you're remembering when you were in second grade and your art teacher put a big red X across your picture because you didn't draw it right, okay? Your response to the word creativity actually triggers a photon storm in your brain, a storm of light in your brain. That storm of light creates a series of neurotransmitters that in turn stimulate an emotional response that is in proportion to the meanings that you hold. So if you're like, woo, I can't wait to get to Michael's and get some glitter today, and you're really excited about being creative, and you, you're going to create excited emotions in response to that. If you were like, I'm really not creative. I wish I was more creative, but I'm not. I'm an accountant. And that was where you came out with your meanings. You might create sort of negative feelings around creativity. And that would create, you know, the, an emotional response that is, again, in alignment with the meanings that you hold. The emotional energy in turn calibrates the heart center. The heart center then is then calibrated to be the core. Because the heart center, what we know about the heart center is got an electromagnetic resonance field at the core of it. Your heart is the source of the law of attraction. And we can scientifically measure now where that magnetic resonance field lives. And in human design, we teach that you have a magnet in your heart called the magnetic monopole that is an attractive force that attracts into your life the things that match your destiny and things that you need to fulfill your destiny. You can calibrate that magnet. And the way in which we calibrate that magnet is through emotional energy. We can also calibrate our emotional energy by the mindset that we have and the meanings that we hold. It's really a brilliant thing to understand because it also now allows you to know that you can tackle this equation from a lot of different places. You know, sometimes changing your mindset is not so easy, right? The mind gets stuck. So you can start changing the emotional quality of the energy and that can change your mindset. Or you can start changing the things that you carry in your heart and that can start changing your narrative and changing your meanings and changing your emotions. It gives you a couple of places to attack this creation model. And Photons are the part of the creative medium when inspires the movements in the first place. Everything that influences the meanings is found in your filter. Okay? Your unique filter, the story of who you are, including your human design, is going to determine the meanings that you hold and what you create out of the quantum field into your life right now. When we explore what's in your filter, we see that your filter is going to be comprised of your life experiences, what you value. Maybe you don't value creativity, so it's not such a big thing for you, right? What you learned to believe is true. Maybe you thought you're not creative because everybody told you and you started to believe it and then you lost connection with your creativity. Your traumas, how you experience your energy, that's going to in part and parcel be determined very much by your human design, your family's values, your genetics, your epigenetics, and your human design. Your human design strategy is the way in which you connect to your highest potential. It takes the figuring out part out of the creative equation, but it begs of us to answer the question, how much do you trust the universe? 
we have this idea that's like, oh, and I hear this a lot in human design, and I, I this is not going to make me popular when I say this, but I really want to drive this point home because it's so, so, so important. I think there's this idea that if you click to get your heels together three times and you follow your strategy, poof, voila, magic life will happen. If you can remember that the purpose of your life is, yes, to experience joy, that's in the chart, but it's really to find the alignment between your soul purpose and your life purpose, and that takes oftentimes a lifetime journey to do, that when you follow your strategy, you might not have everything work out perfectly at first. So if it doesn't, don't get upset and don't beat yourself up and think you're doing it wrong. The purpose of that challenge and the purpose of what we create in our lives or attract into our lives is to teach us, to help us learn and grow. And so sometimes, even though it looks like we're getting something we didn't want, okay, it's still what we need. And it's what we need as part of our growth catalyst on the journey that we're living. And when we can trust in the universe and say, okay, I'm not liking this. It's not so cool. But I trust in the infinite wisdom of the universe. It knows what it's doing. It's teaching me. And I'm going to be at peace with that. Then we can stop wrestling and struggling with what's showing up and then beating ourselves up because we think we're doing it wrong. And instead go, ah, interesting. Huh? I wonder what this is about. And use it. Look at it from a place of loving curiosity and say, wow, what is the universe bringing me and why? Let's look at the five human design types, strategy, and the quantum purpose of the types. Before we do that, let's do just a quick review. What is strategy? Strategy is a specific way of behaving and making a decision. Each type has a unique strategy. So when you live your strategy, you align for what is correct for you. And life does get easier. Maybe not right away. Okay, like I said. But it does eventually get easier because what happens is you stop being someone you're not. And when you are living as someone that you are not, you spend so much energy holding up that fake identity that it's exhausting. So if anything, life gets easier because you begin to use your energy more effectively. Living your strategy allows you to live authentically. So it's much more fulfilling. You get to do what you want, not what society tells you you have to do. Strategy flows both directions. Whatever your strategy is, is also what you need from others. And I don't, that's, not everybody teaches that, but that's really important. And it aligns you with the best way to harmonize your soul curriculum and your life purpose. When you don't play your assigned role or follow your strategy, you're going to meet with resistance. That's really where the resistance kicks in. Okay? And of course, when you live with resistance, you experience what in traditional human design we call the not self. Now, I made a kind of a joke about this. This is why I gave you a very dramatic entrance, right? I can do that again because it was fun. It's a very dramatic entrance for the not self. I'm making it a dramatic entrance because I don't like this term. And I really don't want to use this term anymore in human design. There's nothing in your chart or your life that's not self, okay? It's all you. It's just either you aligned or you not so aligned, but it's all you. And there's something in it. There's something in that journey for you, even if it's technically not authentic. If it's uncomfortable and you feel resistance or you're struggling with it, it's because it's poking on you, trying to get your attention to encourage you to do it differently because you deserve better. We are each an expression of the creativity of the divine. The cathedral of our life journey is an experience of holiness. This isn't a building you go to. It's right inside of you, constructed every moment of your life. We build it by letting go of our need to manipulate, control, and judge, which is why strategy is so beautiful because it takes all that off the table so that we may simply learn to be the creative fulfillment of who we truly are. So let's look at each type in the context of life purpose because each type has a different role or a different life purpose. And each type has a particular strategy, a way of making decisions that's going to influence how aligned you are with your path. So let's start first with the manifester. Manifestors are approximately 8% of the population. Now, traditionally, when we talk about manifestors, 
we talk about manifestors as being initiators. They are here to get things rolling. Now, speaking of vocabulary, I love the word manifestor for manifestors, but I don't love the word manifestor for all the rest of the types because the manifestors are manifestors. But if you are a generator, a manifesting generator, a projector or a reflector, you're also a manifestor in the sense that everybody manifests. And I hear people sometimes talk about, well, I'm not a manifestor, so I can't manifest. That is bullcorn. You all manifest. You are all powerful, creative beings. And you are living in an energetic matrix that is the story of who you are. And as a creator, you are a manifester. But in human design, the manifester type is the type that has within their energy field or their energy creative process an internal nonverbal creative flow. So if you are a manifester, you have this nonverbal creative pulse. And it's telling you through knowingness and feelingness what you need to do. It oftentimes even can be in a sound format. So sometimes manifestors might hear a creative journey as something like this. Da -dink, da -dink, da -dink. It'll make a sound. And I don't know how else to explain it except it makes an internal sound. Okay. So manifestors have this internal nonverbal creative flow. And their role in life is to serve that flow, to serve the fulfillment of that flow. And when they do that, they actually create in the world in such a way that they give all the other types things to respond to, things to be invited into, experiences that get them rolling on their own path. When we talk about manifestors, we talk about, or we're looking at manifestors and we look at manifestor strategy, the manifestor needs to inform others before taking action. Why is this? And by the way, remember I said strategy flows both ways. If you're a manifestor, you also need to be informed. By the people around you because if you're following your internal creative flow you're taking into account everything that's going on around you and if suddenly the plan changes and nobody told you and you've got this internal creative flow now that's saying go do this and you thought it was this way but it's not now it's some way else it can make it very difficult for you to follow your flow okay so the strategy for the manifester is to listen to their internal flow Follow it when it feels right. And if you are an emotional manifester, that means when you are emotionally aligned with the right action, when the timing feels right. If you are an ego manifester, it means when you get signs from your outer reality, then you take action. If you are a, a, a root manifester, when you're manifesting from the root, it's when your root pulse tells you it's time to go, then you go. Okay, You're instinctive or instinctual. That manifester has to then take stock of everyone that's going to be impacted by their action and inform them. And the reason why they inform them is not to get permission. You're a manifester. You don't need permission. It's so that everybody can move out of the way and you can go do what you're going to do without having to deal with the interference of people asking you things like, oh, what are you doing? Do you need help? Because if you have to translate that internal nonverbal creative flow, that service that you're giving to this divine inspiration that flows through you, you have to stop and put language to it. It slows you down and you often lose your connection with the flow. And then you experience the manifestor theme, which is anger. But it's not really anger. I hate this word so much. I don't know if there's a good replacement word for it, but it's not anger. And I think we have such a mythology in human design around the angry manifester. And I have met so many manifestors that are like, I'm not angry. And they're not. They're not angry. This anger is really more about creative flow interrupted. If you think about the creative flow that they're aligning with, that they are serving, that they are listening to, that if a manifestor is attuned to, and that flow gets interrupted, that energy has to go somewhere. And usually it goes, bleh, right? It's like a volcano. But it's not, I'm angry at you because you asked me for help, right? It's not anger. It's that, oh, suddenly this flow got interrupted. This powerful surge of energy had this, got stopped. And now you're like, I'm having to put words to it, which completely takes me out of the flow. It slows me down. I don't know if I stop now, if I'm going to get the flow back. 
It's disrupted energy. And if you are a manifester and you experience that anger, it's not anger. It's disrupted energy. And that energy, that anger response or that disrupted energy response is saying, oh, I was in my creative flow and I lost my connection to my flow. And it's a really important experience or a really important understanding to note because now you can have hopefully the opportunity to at least back up and go, okay, how can I or is it possible for me to recapture that flow? If you can take that pause and back out of the verbal stuff and even go remove yourself from the situation, you might be able to recapture that flow. And then you can get back into it. But to interpret it as anger, I think is really unfair, especially especially for our older manifester women, where let's be real, we still don't get excited about angry women, right? And if a woman is a manifester and her creative flow is stopped, and now she's struggling with this interrupted energy, and everybody's perceiving her as angry, and then so on top of being like, what do I do? I just lost my flow. And now everybody's judging her for being an angry witch, right? What an unfair thing to do to a powerful human being who's here to initiate us into that creative flow. When we look at the quantum purpose of the manifester, the purpose of the manifester on a soul level, the configuration of manifester is all about initiating people into the frequency of transformation and creativity. As an initiating force, the manifester, through following their own flow, stretches the boundaries of what's possible in the human story. And through that stretching of that boundary, initiates the rest of us into a new story about what's possible on the planet. This is the real purpose of the manifester energy. They transform us by following their own path. They create openings at the edges of the human story so that the story itself continues to evolve and we can continue collectively to serve the evolution of that story. The next type is called the generator. Generators are approximately 37% of the population. Generators are here to provide the workforce energy and they are the true builders of the world. So if you think of putting on a show, a movie show, uh, build, doing a show or putting a show on stage, it's the generator type, metaphorically, that's designed to do the light, the camera, the action, build the set, you know, do all the work. They're the workers. Because work is such a prominent part of the generator experience, they really have to be doing a work that satisfies that need to serve the mastery of building. Okay, so work tends to be, for the generator type, something that is really vital for them to do as part of the fulfillment of their purpose. But I'm going to throw a little bit of an asterisk here because, again, I think in traditional human design, we talk a lot about that generators have to do the work they love. And we think, oh, that means work is my life purpose. What that does mean is not so much that your work has to be the fulfillment of your life purpose. And I don't want to have any confusion about that because your life purpose isn't about your job. Your life purpose is to become the creative force, the artist, the canvas of your life, and to be the full expression through whatever it is you do in the world of who you are. And that's true for everyone. For the generators, though, I would say it's more likely that sometimes your work is going to be part of your purpose. But that doesn't mean that it has to be. You might have a totally different purpose over here. Like maybe you volunteer at a shelter. And the work that you do in your daily life gives you the fuel and the fire and the sustenance financially to be able to go do this other work. So let's not get so tied up in this story of your work is your purpose. I want to divorce us all from that story because it's a really mean story to many of us, a destructive story, I think, for a lot of people. Generators are not here to initiate in the way that manifestors do. They need to wait and they need to wait to respond. And what does that mean? That means. Let's use this example. If you're here at work and you're feeling really burned out and you hate your job and you really just want to take a break and you think, oh, I need to take a vacation and you're a generator type, you better darn well not get on the internet and book your vacation. That's initiating. Let's say as a generator type that same afternoon, you're, you go to get your annual physical and the doctor says to you, wow, you're really burned out. And then on the way home, you see a sign with 
a beautiful beach and a sunset and you're like, wow, I'd really like to go do that. And then in your mailbox, you find a postcard with, you know, from a friend of yours that's got a picture like this on it that says, wow. And you look at it and your whole body goes, mm, I want to go to the beach. Now you have things to respond to. You have the doctor, you've got the billboard, you've got the postcard. As a generator, this response thing is not that complicated. It just means that you have to wait to see what shows up outside of your mind. What shows up outside of your mind that feels good and right. That's the other part that we sometimes forget, right? It's what feels good and right. You don't know how much time I coach my clients on, go do what feels good. And they're like, what, really? Yes, go do what feels good because that's your guidance. That's your sacral talking. Your sacral goes, mm, I want to go to the beach, right? That's how that sacral works it is that inner sensual sound. That sacral sound that says, hmm, I want to go do this. And it comes in response to what shows up in your life, not your mind. It shows up outside of your life. So the generator response is to wait to respond. And you have to respond to something that shows up in your outer reality and then respond. And it has to be something that feels good. Now, the generator emotional theme is frustration. Let's talk about what does frustration mean? Uh, every generator I do readings for, when they see that, they're like, yep, I'm frustrated. Why are we frustrated as generators? Here's why. The generator has a stair-step learning curve. They are not designed to gain mastery in this ascending curve that never has pauses in it. Generators have cycles of pause in their creative growth. So if you're a generator type and you respond to something, when you first get into that relationship with whatever it is that you responded to, it's awesome. You have a rapid rise in skills. You get really good at it. You love it. And then you sit on a plateau. So if, let's say, you started to learn to play tennis, you know, the first time you started to play tennis, you'd be, you'd learn, you'd learn, maybe you'd get really good at your serve, and then all of a sudden you'd get stuck on a plateau. And it wouldn't matter how much you practice, how much you went to lessons, you wouldn't be getting any better. The challenge is, when you get on that plateau, is to not quit. And that's the biggest challenge for generator types because they tend to feel frustrated on those plateaus, and then they quit. Frustration is the symptom of the buildup of momentum and energy that is preparing you for the next cycle of expansion and growth. If you're a generator, you may very well have had the experience. Frustration is the buildup of momentum. And when you feel frustrated, it means pause, be present to where you are, keep calibrating your intentions around where you'd like to be, and then see what shows up. See what shows up. It might be that when you're stuck in that frustrated part, that something else shows up that you respond to that lets you then quit what you're doing. Okay? It lets you quit. Or you might get the next opportunity that takes you up to the next level of mastery, the next part of the growth cycle of your creative process until you get on to the next plateau. But what generators tend to do is they cut themselves off short because they let the frustration cause them to quit because they don't understand that frustration is momentum. We don't think of frustration as being momentum, but it is. And if you can start to go, okay, I am a frustrated generator, that means that I'm building momentum. And while I'm building momentum, I should probably get really clear about my intentions and really make sure my emotional energy is deeply aligned with what I'm intending to create and hold the course here instead of bailing and quitting. The quantum purpose of the generator is to physically manifest creativity and express through devotion. Devotion means you do it again and again and again and again until you get it right. The next type is the manifesting generator. Manifesting generators are approximately 33% of the population. And very much like the generator types, they also provide the workforce energy and are also the true builders of the world. They're here to do the work of the world. And that means putting, doing the physical effort required to build the tangible world. When we look at the manifesting generator strategy, it's very much a buy one, get one free kind of an idea. Because there is a manifester quality to the manifesting generator. So the manifesting generator will have the generator part and live their life. They are designed to live like the generator. So if you're a manifesting generator, you're not a manifester, but you are a generator with a little manifester flavor. Okay? So if, I, if you're a manifesting generator, when I went through the manifester piece, you probably also related to the manifester piece as well as the generator piece. 
So there is this ability for you to have an internal nonverbal creative flow as a manifesting generator, but it's a little bit of a tricky place because you have to respond to your outer reality before you know where to put that manifesting energy. So you can get into that nonverbal creative flow, but you can't get into it from here. You don't get into it from emotional alignment. You get into it only through response. Meaning your outer reality has to give you the go signal for that internal creative flow. But you do have that internal creative flow. And so just like the manifester, once you do get that, that response to go, then you will move very quickly without language as well. And you will experience to a certain degree some of the same themes of the manifester, that, that interrupted energy that the manifester often can feel. And I, I know I've joked about this a lot with my students. I, I am a manifesting generator. And in my house, you know, we have a rule. Don't put anything in the doorways because if I'm moving fast in my flow, because I've got empty the dishwasher, feed the dogs, feed the cats, make lunch for the kid, make breakfast for the kid and get everything ready for the day all like in 10 minutes, I can do it, but I need nobody to get in my way. Don't get in my doorway because my flow will get interrupted and then eruptions happen, right? So that interrupted flow can happen. The piece that's important to remember is that when you are a manifesting generator and you get something to respond to, you will have a tendency to skip over steps. And when we say skip over steps, it means you skip over that stair-step learning plateau. So you might take two or three leaps over two or three steps. Because technically, as a manifesting generator, one of your purposes is to find shortcuts. You might find that the details aren't so important. But... Sometimes you might find that they are. And so for the manifesting generator, if they skip steps, sometimes they also have to respond to going back and fixing the steps that they skipped. And one of the things that can be the most frustrating, I think, for a manifesting generator or as a manifesting generator is the idea that when you, when you, no matter how careful you are with the details, no matter how much you try not to skip a step, you just do. And it's part of your nature. And to not beat yourself up about what's wrong with me. Why do I keep missing details? Why do I keep skipping steps? Why am I, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're going to skip steps if manifesting generator. That's natural. And there are going to be a lot of people that are going to want you to go back and fix the steps you skipped. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to try to get you to not skip the steps and tell you exactly how you need to do it. You're not here to be told what to do. You're here to follow your own inner creative flow in response. And just like the manifester, when you're about to take action, you need to survey who's going to be impacted by whatever it is that you're doing. Then you need to let them know what you're doing, not because you need help, not because you need you know, permission, but because you need them to get ready for this wave of energy, get out of the doorways, everybody, right? And then, then you take action. You will have sustainable action, the ability to have sustainable action once you get going. And I think that's a really key piece, too, to understand about both the generator types, the generators and the manifesting generators. There is a quality of sustainable energy with the defined cycle. It can keep going and going and going unless there are other, there are other factors in the chart that can sometimes slow it down. But for the most part, the sacral as a pure motor has sustainability built into it. And it is the only, the only place in the chart where there is sustainability. It's very difficult to talk about parts of human design. Like if we just talk about types, there are general guidelines, but there are other things in a specific chart. Your individual chart might modulate a little bit how your type functions, which is why getting a reading is really, I believe, an irreplaceable thing to give yourself. You know, you owe it to yourself to really explore getting a human design reading because. Following your type is beautiful, and it, it does resolve, I think, a lot of challenge. And it's not the only thing. Sometimes there are other factors in the chart that are going to influence how your, your strategy reacts or other things that you might need uh, to keep you in harmony with the full potential of the expression of your energy. Okay, so that might be the other piece that I might say to you. And, you know, I, I have to just throw this last piece in here. I do believe that we, we miss trauma a lot. And I do believe that the definition that we have of trauma in our collective at this point isn't big enough. And that the real definition of trauma is any event, perception, or experience that causes you to lose connection with your sense of self-worth. 
And sometimes those experiences can be very subtle. I mean, it can be something as subtle as your parent saying something to you when you're 16. And that one statement can be so traumatic that it can cause you to disconnect from your sense of value. And it will influence the choices you make then from that point on and maybe even potentially leave you in a state of being frustrated for years until you burn yourself out. And that burnout, but burnout is really a blessing from the universe. It doesn't feel like it because, you know, sometimes when you're burned out, you are struggling to make money, blah, blah, blah. But it's oftentimes a really a, a loving cosmic pause. So, all right, I want to get through this really quickly because I want to, I don't want to miss the the reflectors and I always miss the reflectors at the end and then they're hurt. The manifesting generator emotional strategy or emotional theme is frustration and anger. And again, the anger is the interruption, the creative flow and the frustration is the feeling stuck on the plateaus and is a symptom of momentum building. Okay. So again, interpreting this frustration, anger response and going, okay, the flow got interrupted. I need to go back and recalibrate. Or, oh, I'm feeling this momentum building and it's it's huge and it's intense and it's fiery. I need to breathe. I need to meditate during the cycle. I need to not do anything crazy until oh, something else shows up. Real quick with the manifesting generators too. You need to, if you're a manifesting generator, do more than one thing at a time or have one, more than one project at a time. A couple of different projects simultaneously. Not because they're all going to come to fruition, but because... You need to keep your energy moving. Otherwise, it's like building up static. You need to have a place to expend that energy. So if you're trying something and it's not working as a manifesting generator, it might just be that that's there in your life because it helps you manage your energy better. The quantum purpose of the manifesting generator is to physically manifest creativity and speed up the quantum process as well as linear time. The manifestors, oops. Projectors are here to guide and direct others. The strategy for the projector is to wait for the recognition and invitation. And a lot of times projectors will say to me, well, what does that mean? Do I have to wait for a real invitation? Yes. You're not going to miss the invitation. You're not going to miss the invitation. And I want you to really get that. It will be obvious when it hits. It'll be like it's coming at you in slow motion. Okay. And it'll be like whoop, time stops and you suddenly got an invitation. You don't need to wait to be invited into the little things in life. You don't need to wait to be invited to fill up your gas tank in your car. It's about the big things, friendships, romance, romance career, work opportunities, where to live. And if you're going to make a decision about a big thing, always wait to be invited or ask before sharing your gifts and your guidance and your directions with others. Okay, so wait for the big things and then always wait. To be invited or asked before sharing your gift of guidance and direction with others. Because what you have is so precious. Don't waste it on people who don't get the value of it. So projectors often ask me, what do I do? You know, what do I do to manipulate an invitation? First of all, don't. But here's the trick for you. You need two things to get a good invitation. Number one, you have to have a high sense of your value. Okay. You need to get how precious you are. And if you're not there yet as a projector, that's your number one job while you're waiting is to work on your sense of self-worth and the preciousness, the value of what you have to bring to the table. And number two, you got to work on your energy because projectors don't have sustainable energy. And consequently, if they are burned out or exhausted, they're not going to get invitations because the universe knows or your aura is communicating, hey, not right now. I'm too tired. Bitterness is the name of the emotional theme for the projectors. The bitterness of the projector is not about, it's not fair and it's your fault, which is how it sometimes comes out. Bitterness is a symptom of exhaustion. Okay? It's a symptom of exhaustion because you start needing other people to fulfill your energy needs because you can't access your own. And they, if they're not fulfilling your energy needs, if they're not seeing your value, if they're not tapping into you, because you're exhausted, it's not because of you, because your aura says, I'm exhausted. And if you are a bitter projector, your number one job needs to be to restore your energy reserves and work on your sense of value because you deserve better. So bitterness is a marker of energy depletion. It's not bitterness. I, we have to figure out different words for this. It's a marker of energy depletion. 
So if you're feeling that bitterness, that's you saying, I'm tired. I'm tired. So take care of that first and work on the value that you have to bring to the world. And don't compromise on that value in any way. The quantum purpose of the projector is to hold the energy template of what's to come and to clear the vibration of the collective consciousness. Projectors are constantly scrubbing and cleaning the energy of the planet. And that's an exhausting job. You can be a projector and be doing nothing except lying on the couch. But while you're lying on that couch, you're holding the subtle body template of the planet together. And you're keeping it energetically aligned. And you're, you're anchoring that grid. And you're making sure that the grid is strong and ready for whatever is coming next. For whatever the generators are going to fill it in with next. So you are holding the potential of what's possible for humanity energetically in place. So if you think you're not doing nothing as a projector, I promise you your every moment of waking and sleeping is holding on tight, white knuckling maybe at this point in our evolution, white knuckling the, you know, by holding the, the grid together so that we can continue to grow and evolve and expand into this template of a world of sustainable peace. The reflectors are approximately 1% of the population. If you're a reflector, you are a wise observer. You magnify and reflect all that is around and you mirror it back for others. You are a lunar being and your strategy is to wait 29 days or the full lunar cycle. And in that process of waiting, you need to do one very important thing. That is, you need to talk about your decisions with the people around you. And this is actually true for projectors too. When you're a projector and when you're a reflector, you need to have in your social group sounding boards you don't need advice okay you don't need advice neither one of you projectors or reflectors you don't need advice but you need people who are going to hear you out because it's through the process of talking through your decisions and seeing those decisions reflected or projected in conversation you get to hear your own voice you can manage your own self you can get clarity about what you need based on your own your own hearing of your own voice. So while you're waiting as a reflector, you need to be talking to people. You need to be talking to people about your choices and decisions. And you might need to wait, by the way, a couple of lunar cycles. You're not here to move fast and embrace that. And that's a tricky way to be in the world when you are a reflector because this world works very, very quickly. And it can be very difficult to be in a very different time flow than the rest of the planet. The emotional theme for the reflector is disappointment. Now, when we look at a reflector chart, what we see is that the reflector chart has the ability to take in every aspect of humanity, amplify it, and experience it within their body. They're here to reflect the health of their community. They're here to reflect back to the world what's going on in the world. And because of the degree of openness that they have, the reflector knows inside of themselves to the depth of their being the full potential of what's possible for humanity and reflectors stand there with that understanding inside of them and then they look out in the world and they're like oh my god this is what we're doing with our potential are you kidding me okay so it can be extremely disappointing reflectors can see innately the potential in others and they oftentimes don't recognize that that person is not living their potential. So they get disappointed in other people because other people don't fulfill the possibility or their potential. And they get disappointed because society pushes on us all to make decisions quickly. They're under constant pressure to choose, to choose, decide, decide. And they can't correctly because they need time for clarity. And so oftentimes that disappointment is also disappointment in their own life choices because they make a decision under pressure. And then because of the pressure, it's not the right decision. And then they're forced to kind of sit with that decision or be stuck in that decision sometimes for a long time before they can make a decision to get out of that situation again. So that disappointment is, can be you know, a marker that they haven't taken the time to really look at the people around them, and they really haven't taken the time to make the correct decisions for themselves. So the disappointment of the reflector is oftentimes a marker or a sign that they haven't taken the time. 
And then the first thing a reflector needs to do more than anything is align with time and timing. And then this is the second thing that's so important because the reflector is here to reflect the health of specific communities, not everybody, but specific groups of people or specific communities. You also have to be in the right place as a reflector. You have to be in your place as the reflector of your people, which means you've got to find that place that feels good and right to you. And that's not just feeling level. You also have to look and watch and make sure that not that people don't just feel great, that they're actually living true to their greatness. Because if they're fulfilling their greatness, then then you can live and be in that environment without the disappointment theme kicking in. The quantum purpose of the reflector is to reflect the human condition and human potential. Oops. All right, that's it. I, I did. I'm sorry. I went a little bit over you guys. I appreciate your patience. Just a quick note: the more you surrender to your life purpose and allow it to unfold, the easier it is to align with the quantum with quantum possibilities and quantum creativity. All right. Be well. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye.